We have been in a series for quite some time that's going to wrap up next week. I'll pick up some other apologetic type stuff as we move forward. First of September, I want to begin a series through the book of First and Second Timothy, the books of First and Second Timothy. And so we are going to be doing that starting the first Sunday of September. But we're wrapping up what we have been doing for the last 14 weeks. This is so crazy. This, is, this series has been called My World View. And what we're discussing is dealing with the question, what is the foundation of your faith? And in our culture, you're either going to land in one of two areas. You're going to land in what we know now as a natural worldview. And the idea behind the natural worldview, we'll talk a little more in just a second in detail. The idea behind the natural worldview is the, is the idea that nature is God. Nature is eternal. There is no personal God. You get to call the shots in your life. You get to determine your own truth. Because if there is no God, then there's no one to tell you what's true, what's acceptable. It's up to you. And so you'll hear the phrase like, well, that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. When it comes to many of the things related to our faith and our beliefs. On the other side, we have what's known as a biblical worldview. The biblical worldview has at its very foundation the Bible. Just as Coach Woodward was up here with his Bible... That is the foundation on which we stand. We haven't dealt with this kind of issue enough in the churches because we end up with a culture who says, well, I like that part, so I'll take that and I'll, I'll take that as my truth, but I like this part over here, so I'll take that as my truth too. And we find ourselves trying to build our lives on two separate foundations that are totally opposite of each other. So I wanted to do this series so that you could understand that part of it and deal with the question in your own life. So what am I building my life on? Not what have I accomplished in my life, but what am I building my life on? Am I building my life on the word of God or am I building my life on culture and the cultural beliefs of naturalism? The other reason I did this is because with so many changes coming in our culture right now, I wanted us to be able to understand the why. When, when a decision is made that affects the entire country, I think it's important for you to be able to see the foundation of where this decision is coming from. It might be an individual that is telling you the way things are going to be, but it exposes the foundation on which they stand. And that's why I have said over the last 14 weeks, You'll be hard-pressed to convince anyone that today this nation is a Christian nation. This nation is founded on Christian principles. And the faith in God and the work of Jesus Christ has been foundational to the America that has been since the beginning. But that has, as it did in Europe, as it did in England, that has slowly eroded to where we have the culture that we have now. And so I want to deal with, in, in the last issue that I want to deal with on these foundations, it's going to take me two weeks, and, and we're going to be kind of quick today. I was going to have Russ, um, uh, Russ Porter come up here on the stage to be with me. He's going to be here next week. Russ is a man you are going to deeply appreciate. Because of the work that has been going on or the event that has been going on in our own community and at the public library, there has, there has been a, a display that should cause everybody to shudder just a little bit regarding sexuality. And the display was set in the, um, in the children's section of the library and it's just... I got a chance to look at the books as Russ was showing them to me. Wow. I want you to know Russ is the guy who has been going to the library board meetings. He's the guy who has been going to the commissioners because God placed it on his heart 
that someone has to step up and take a stand. He is putting himself out there. And next week, he's going to share with you some of those things um, and where things stand right now regarding what's allowed to be displayed in the public library. Um, so we'll deal with that next week. Uh, so for now, we're dealing with the topic of the Trinity. When you hear the word Trinity, what comes to your mind as far as in the Christian world? When you hear the word Trinity, typically you think in one of three areas here, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three beings in one. So that if you take anyone out of that equation, God is not God. All three make up the one God. Now, we have trouble, understandably, when you're trying to explain this to someone, we have trouble explaining it because we're going to take the idea of three in one as a part of our faith, really a core part of our faith. You'll notice I didn't have that, this in the fist, but we could add a sixth finger, I guess, to our fist um, because the idea of the Trinity, the truth of the Trinity is, is important for us who are building our lives on a biblical foundation. What I want you to know first, though, before we dig into that part of it and try to come to understand the Trinity, which is my goal this week and next week, I want you to understand that naturalism has a Trinity as well. They have three things that they adhere to that must be in place in order to explain everything there is and in order to explain the fact that you're even on the scene, okay? While the biblical worldview would say God has brought you into existence, God had you in his mind from the very beginning, and he is the creator, he's the one that does that, the natural worldview, which is atheistic in and of itself, will say that you're here without purpose, without intention, you're here accidentally. You just happen to come along the scene at this point of history and the history of the universe. We're going to look at the trinity of naturalism real quick. The first is this. The Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. The Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. I don't really take issue with the, the first three words. The Big Bang. I don't really take issue with that because here's what I figured. When God said, let there be, something went pop because there it was. Okay, so I don't, I don't have an issue with that. What I, I personally have an issue with and, and rationally have an issue with and a lot of science has an issue with is that 13.8 billion years. Now, I'm not trying to defend an, a 6,000 or 8,000 year old universe. That's what I believe. I believe in a young universe. But I want to show you the problems of this number 13.8. All right? The, the problem is twofold, and, and there are certainly others. I'm just giving you these two. The first is the problem of the expansion rate. The expansion rate. And what I mean by that is we live in a universe that is expanding. As a matter of fact, check this out. It expands at a rate of 46 miles per second. See, in your last five seconds, we just went over 200 miles apart. <laughs> now, if you take the current e expansion rate, which is far removed from the Big Bang, which you would think the Big Bang would be an enormous, very fast expansion rate, and you extrapolate that out over all the billions of years, Here's your problem. Just extrapolating the 46 miles every second out makes us have, be a part of a universe that could not even contain life because everything is moving so far apart so rapidly. And so it becomes an issue for, for the naturalist who says that everything is 13.8 is, um, billion years old at the Big Bang. It's, it's a real problem for them. 
because nothing could expand at that rate, and we're at a slower rate than it would have been at the beginning, nothing could expand and still hold itself together. So the fact that we even exist, the fact that there's even a planet that can contain life is a big deal. Okay, that's the first part of their trinity. The second part of their trinity is this, and, and it's, it's a word called abiogenesis. I just said that so you know I, I know something. Um, but, it, but it means spontaneous generation, and this is basically the picture that life appeared from non-life. There was non-life, and then out of that, all of a sudden, came life. And, and the, the trouble with abiogenesis, and any, anyone who continues to hold to that sponta spontaneous generation, the trouble with that is that it has been an issue that has been debunked by science itself for many years, but yet it's still taught as if it's fact that everything came or, or life appeared from non-life. Look at this quote. Um, the, the uh, the theory of abiogenesis is based on the what? The assumption. Please don't forget that word. Based on the assumption that everything must happen by natural causes. And see, if you're a naturalist, you believe that everything has to happen by natural causes. That there is no God who did this. So that's an assumption you're making. You don't know that. It's your assumption. If everything happens by natural cause, then life must have come from non-life by natural causes. That's the idea that sits behind their teaching. The problem with this theory, there is no evidence that life comes spontaneously from non-life. There, no, there is no evidence that exists that life would come from non-life. It's based on an assumption. It's taught as a fact based on an assumption. Okay, the third part of their trinity is this. It's common ancestry. Common ancestry is that says that all living organisms are related. You know that bug you just smashed at your house this past week? You may have smashed your cousin. <laughs> That's the idea of common ancestry is that we have, we have a connection to all life forms because everything came from that pool of some kind of genetic code that brought this forth and brought that forth. What genetics has done, it has disproved the common ancestry of all species. The study of just genetics has and it's good we have that now because, you know, you didn't have that a long time ago. So you just had to say, oh, that can't be true. But now genetics teaches us that that, that's, that certainly is true. That there is not a relation between you and another living organism that is not human. There's not a relation there. And so, so you have those three pillars that make up a trinity for naturalism. But yet those three pillars are really, really on shaky ground. Not when it comes to the Bible, although it is, when it comes to science, which would become their God anyway, naturalism and science. Now what I wanna do concerning the Trinity from a biblical worldview, and, and this is as far as I wanna go today because here in just a little bit, after we pray, I'm going to ask you all to just stay seated because I've got something I need to share with you just as a family. If you're visiting, stay seated. You need to hear it too, okay? So we're going to, we're going to do that in just a minute. And just so you go, oh gosh, what's we're going to tell us? It's good. It's not like getting called to the principal's office. So all is good. Here's what I want you to know, understanding God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. First thing is this. God is relational. God is relational. This is important for you to understand this. Even though you, you may have believed that within yourself, you have to understand that even at the level of being an agnostic, well, okay, maybe there's a God somewhere, but that word agnostic, agnostic 
A meaning it's the negative, not. Gnostic meaning known. It's a God who doesn't know you, doesn't care about you, and you don't know him. It would be a, a God who doesn't have relationship with what he has created. The first thing we have to understand is without even looking at creation, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are relational. God himself is relational because he's made up of these three. And by the time we end this session next week, we'll understand and see these three working together, which is really a cool, cool picture. Um, I want you to look at John chapter 1, verse 18. This is going to be on the overhead. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son. What's the next phrase? Okay, wait one second. I don't know if, if this is one of those things that, you know, we don't think about it enough, but it should make your mind go. So wait a second. The Son, you mean Jesus? The one that was born of a virgin and he grows up and now he's walking on the earth. He dies. On, you're telling me that that dude was God. Yeah, that's what we're telling you. Because it takes all three to make God. He is God in the flesh. First, John would tell us that if you don't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, you are not from God. You believe the lie. So Jesus, as we look at that verse, who is himself God and is in what? Closest relationship with the Father has made him known. That word closest relationship literally means intimate. So the Son, who is God, is in an intimate relationship with the Father, who is God. And there is this there is this relationship that exists between them. I want to keep moving. First, I mean, stay in John, just go over to chapter 16. I want to look at verse 14 and check this out. He, meaning the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, meaning Jesus. Because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Now, you have this, you have this picture of the Holy Spirit who brings glory to Jesus. Okay, what does that mean? We'll, we'll go through that in just a second. Because I, I want you to go over to John 17, verse 1. This is Jesus now praying to his Father. Look at what he prays. Father... The hour has come. Glorify who? Your son. your son. That your son may do what? Glorify. glorify you. So you've got all this glorifying stuff going on. As a matter of fact, in scripture, we're told to bring glory to God. And, and so this is going, this for me was one of those moments as I've been studying this. This for me is one of those moments where I go, I like this. <laughs> I really like this. Because... If God is relational within himself, I want you to understand this. This means that he didn't need you. He didn't bring you into existence because he was lonely. I saw a movie when I was a kid, and I'm not forget because it was this deep God type voice. And, and when the, in the movie theater, um, the screen was black and the voice started and the first words of this whole thing was God was lonely. <laughs> God was just there by himself. Just him. All eternity. If you understand the Trinity and you understand that God is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he wasn't lonely. He was, he was in relation with the other two parts they were each in relation with the other two parts of the Trinity. So they didn't need us. And what were they doing? Well, they were glorifying each other. What? What's it mean? What are they always walking around going, oh, yes, yes, yes. What, what's it mean? What does it look like? We're going to go there. Um, 
the trouble with, uh, well, let me, let me go to glory first. The word glory, let's put that slide up there. Glorify. I want you to look at this. To do what? To do what? Grace. To, Enjoy. to, Enjoy. and to do what? Okay, now I want you to see that. To glorify someone is to put them in a place where you shine the spotlight on them. It's not about you. Now, I want you to check this out. So what is the Father doing? He's glorifying the Spirit and the Son. Are you seeing that? He, he is shining the spotlight on them. And while He's shining the spotlight on them, Jesus is over here shining the spotlight on him and the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit's over here shining the light on the Father and the Son. It is a perfect relation, relationship among the three beings who make up the one. It is all, it, it really, I guess the best way I would say it is, it's all about the other. Are you with me there? That's how they operate. That's what they do. And, and we see that not just in the passages I just read to you, but you'll see that through the other scriptures just as well. Now, I want to talk about just for a moment the relational impact of the Trinity. So if God is relational, how does that impact us who are made in his image? Because if you're made in his image, and you are, if you're made in his image, then you were made to be relational. And, and I even want to give you this picture. Let me see if I have this in my notes, because if I don't, I'm telling you anyway. Um, I don't see it. I'm telling you. So this is for free today. When God created Adam and Eve, he created, we know from the scripture that he created them in his image. That means that he created them relational. Are you with me? He not only created them relational so that they could be relational with each other perfectly, but so they could have a relationship with him. And so this Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, creates everything in existence. And then he brings humans on the scene to be created in his image, to be just like him. And now he is having a relationship with him, so much so that the scripture will say, and as God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, what was he doing in the garden? Well, he was having a relationship with Adam and Eve. So now they're all in relation to each other. Are you with me? That's such a cool picture. I'll talk more about this next week, but here's, I've heard it put this way, and I think it's a wonderful picture, that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved in a dance. You'll see where that word comes from in just a second. They're involved in a dance, and as they dance in relationship to each other, right after creation, they say, hey, Adam and Eve, you want to dance? Come on. Let's dance. So, so that's, that's the Holy Spirit, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit creating. And now you have heaven brought to earth and it's a perfect environment. And everything the scripture doesn't say, and it was good. It says this, and it was very good. All the other days, oh, it was good. But not this day. This was very good on this day. Now. Since God created us in his image, he creates us to be relational. In that relationship, then, we have been made to do exactly what they are doing. We are made, then, to bring glory to him. Why not? Shine the light on him. Praise him. That's what we have been created for. And so that you don't get the idea what well, sounds like God's just a glory hog. No, because he's giving glory too. They're all just giving it out. <laughs> and so everything and in this perfect environment, everything is bringing glory 
and is a world of glory. Kind of a picture of probably, and I don't know this for sure, but what heaven might be like. Okay? Now, because of our sinful nature, because Adam and Eve fell, they sinned, and don't you go blaming your sin on them. They made up their mind to disobey God, and when you sin, you've made up your mind to disobey Him. So, anyway, I won't get on that. Um, so, when they sin, now, when we talk about relationships among ourselves, and even our relationship with God, we kind of keep this question in mind. What can or will this person or these people do for me? So a lot of relationships aren't built on, hey, I'm, you know what? I just want to sacrifice myself for you. Instead, relationships are built on, man, I wonder what they can do. They can do to help me out. And it becomes self-centered because really sin at its core is self-centeredness. So rather than being others focused, now we are self-absorbed and self-focused individuals. Now this is going to impact everything you know about relationships. That's the part I'm going to take off with next week. Rather than being others focused, we find ourselves in almost every relationship we're in, demanding our own rights, demanding our own way, and boy, when we don't get it, and someone steps in and causes us disappointment, do we ever change? And so we, we understand that sin has had an impact on relationships. Next week, those, I'll make those very specific. I want you to look at what Tim Keller says, and it's going to be with this that I'm going to uh, pray. So Matt, you, uh, you can head back towards that uh, technology stuff and get ready to take care of that. Look at what Tim Keller says. Nothing makes us more miserable than what? Self-absorption. Now follow this thinking. The endless, what? Unsmiling concentration. The endless unsmiling concentration on our needs, our wants, treatment, and our ego. Self-centeredness leads to disintegration. That statement is where I'm going to pick up next week because it is, it is a great description of what relationships look like when relationships are centered around self-absorption. I love you for what you can do for me. I like you for what you can do for me. Hey, you want to be friends on Facebook? Um, and, and don't you dare cross me or I'll unfriend you. Um, so, so what does... What does this relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit look like now in our lives as people who are infected with the sin nature, infected with self-absorption? And come on, we are. You're generally selfish. I am. You are. That's where sin really shows itself. And now in this state, as a person who, who still has a sin nature, even though he's following Christ, what does the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have to do with my life now? How does it really impact me? That's where we're going next week. Um, and, and so we're going to stop there. Sarah, you're back there on the computer.